Grizzly Crimes from Past Murder on the Opening Night It wasn't a very good show. Some of the biggest names in New York high society had turned up to see the new musical comedy opening on the roof garden of Madison Square Garden. Mamselle Champagne, the entertainment was billed as, but its bubble were flat and the fashionable socialites were yearning when the male lead got up to sing about love. Then there was a gunshot and another two shots. The orchestra stopped playing and nobody yawned anymore. Harry Kendall Thaw, 34-year-old son of a Pittsburgh railway magnate, was standing among the cafe concern tables with a pistol smoking in his hand. Before him, Stanford White, the nation's most celebrated architect, was crumpled in his chair. Slowly he slid to the floor, blood spilling in crimson cataracts over his expensive shirt front. There were two bullet holes in his body. The third shot was lodged in his brain. All around, people screamed and stampeded for the exit. Vainly, the manager called for the show to go on. The date was 25th of June, 1906, and the roof garden murder was to keep America reeling for months to come. The public learned quickly that it was all a love triangle killing. Thaw had publicly gunned down the seducer of his wife. I'm glad I killed him. He ruined my wife. He had called on the fateful evening. But in this particular triangle were caught lurid shapes of lust, sadism and madness, all refracted in the prism of big money. The woman in the case was Evelyn Nesbitt Thaw, the beautiful wife of the arrested gunman. Standards of prettiness changed over the decades, but her beauty stands somehow outside time. The photographs show a pale oval face, dark eyes, sensual mouth and lustrous curls, frail and voluptuous. Her features might have embodied the feminine mystique in a painting of any era. In fact, Evelyn Nesbitt had started out as an artist's model, but she soon moved out into the show world. At the age of 15, she was already appearing as a chorus girl in Flodora, a smash musical of the period. From the show, one song is still well remembered. Tell me, pretty maiden, are there any more at home like you? And from the high-kicking chorus line, came another pretty maiden who appeared in the pages of this book, Nan Patterson. Evelyn Nesbitt had known the murdered architect long before she had known her husband. Stanford White was internationally respected for his building designs, which included, ironically, Madison Square Garden itself. He was a large man with a florid complexion, mustachioed face, and a rogue's lifestyle. On his first meeting with Evelyn, he took her and another girl upstairs to a luxurious room in his apartment. It was equipped with a red velvet swing and he gave the girls turns on it, pushing them right up to the ceiling where their feet reached a Japanese umbrella. But beyond his exotic decor and his playful games, White exhibited deeper passions. In his studio at the apartment, he soon had Evelyn posing for photographs in a silken kimono. On a later occasion, Having dazzled her with champagne, he took her to a room whose walls and ceilings were covered with mirrors. There, he seduced her while she was sleeping. She was still only 16 years old. Evelyn went on to become one among several mistresses kept by the architect. He paid her weekly sums of money, brought her out into society and showed her off. Being married to a very long-suffering wife, White could not offer the girl his hand, and that was one advantage which Harry K. Thaw had over the middle-aged architect. Thaw met Evelyn Nesbitt while she was going around with her seducer, and in the murder trial which was to come, his lawyers did what they could to suggest that Thaw had chivalrously redeemed the fallen showgirls. Certainly, Thaw was outraged by the story of the girl's initial seduction. He hated the architect always referring him to as the beast and the bastard, 
but Thor himself was no noble knight errant. Actually, he was a monster. The spoiled playboy son of a millionaire family, Harry Thor promised to marry Evelyn if she would run away with him to Europe. She accepted the offer, little knowing her admirer's sexual tastes. It was in the Tyrolean castle of Scotch Kazakhstan that they were first revealed. One morning at breakfast in the rented castle, he stripped her of her bathrobe and left her naked except for her slippers. Producing a cowhide whip, he threw her onto the bed. I was powerless and attempted to scream. The girl was to testify. But Tho placed his fingers in my mouth and tried to choke me. He then, without any provocation and without the slightest reason, began to inflict on me several severe and violent blows with the cowhide whip. She was in bed for three weeks afterwards and after similar episodes were to occur before the marriage. It was one of Thor's kinks, like the cocaine habit he had acquired. Other girls had received the same treatment at his hand. Why did the chorus girl marry a man with such malevolent passion? Part of the answer must lie in the lure of the Thor millions, Amistin Railroads, Coal and Coke. There is evidence that some pressure was applied on Evelyn by her own family, and it was not hard to imagine their prompting. Darling, your good looks won't last forever. Stanford White could scarcely offer protection. In fact, he seemed to have collaborated with her family in pressing for the marriage to go ahead. Whatever the reason, Evelyn Nesbitt married Harry Thaw on 4th of April 1905. It was a big society wedding in which the bride wore white, despite the fact the pair were known to have cohabited in New York already. The couple set up homes in the Thaw's Pittsburgh mansion, and if the playboy's own family were none too happy about the marriage, they made the best of it that they could. It was Harry Thaw who became more and more unbalanced. He bought a pistol and was seen posing with it like a duelist in his bedroom. On 25th of June 1906, just over a year after his wedding, he took Evelyn to New York where they dined together at the Café Martin before going with friends to Madison Square Garden for the opening of Mademoiselle Champagne. Stanford White arrived later and took a table on his own. The lackluster performance had been going on for some time before Evelyn decided it was too dull to endure. The party rose, heading for the elevator. Evelyn in fact reached the lobby before noticing that her husband was not with the party. Disarmed in the elevator, moments after the shooting, Thaw was to explain to the district attorney, I saw him sitting there, big, fat and healthy, and there Evelyn was, poor delicate little thing, all trembling and nervous. So spoke the sadist. The Thaw family was to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars not only on their son's legal defense, but on press campaigns to smear his victim. White, of course, presented an easy target for slander, considering his rogue lifestyle. But Harry Thaw made no promising defendant either. His first trial for murder opened in January 1907 and did not end until some four months later. The jury eventually arrived at a split verdict. Seven declared Thaw guilty of first-degree murder, but five held out for not guilty by reason of insanity. A year later, at a second trial, more was made of the issue of madness. Cases of mental disorders in the Thaw family was discussed. A brother keeper described savage whipping that the defendant had administrated to the young girls. The jury on this occasion achieved an unanimous verdict. After 72 hours, they voted Harry Thaw to be not guilty by reason of insanity. Thaw was committed to the New York State Asylum for the criminally insane, and the story might have ended there, but for the wealth and energy of his family, who pressed continuously for his release. Thaw did in fact taste freedom in 1913, but not through any court decision. One morning in August, he escaped the asylum, climbed into a waiting car, and fled for sanctuary to Canada. Much diplomatic pressure was exerted by United States government and the fugitive was forced to return after only a month. He was jailed at Concord, New Hampshire, and eventually sent back to New York tirelessly 
the Thaw family campaigned through their lawyers for his release. And in the end, they won. In July 1915, as a result of yet another trial, Harry K. Thaw was declared both sane and innocent of charges against him. It was an extraordinary decision. Evelyn immediately divorced him and went off to live her own life. A free man, Harry Thaw responded to his good fortune only a few months later by kidnapping and cruelly horsewhipping a Kansas City youth who had incurred his displeasure. Again declared insane, he was again committed to an asylum. Again a court hired him to be sane after all, and again in 1924 he was released from custody. Harry Thaw died of a coronary in Florida in February 1947. His case had made New York a babel of gossip, loud rumor, and frank accusation. But you do not have to be especially cynical to believe that, in the end, the most persuasive voice of all was the voice of money. If you have enjoyed this video, please like, subscribe, and leave a comment as it helps the YouTube algorithm grow the channel. You'd find similar contents in my other videos. Have a safe day. Signing off.